So again, my name is Meg Bowen. I use she, they pronouns. Uh, and I'm a member of the patient Center primary care home uh, site visit team. I'm a compliance specialist with that, with that, uh, that team. And um, so I am actually in, in my role, I'm in the far end of data collection. So I'm in the trenches with providers as we do this work. So I'll be walking you through the first couple of slides today, and I'm delighted that you're here. So welcome to the Oregon Healthcare Workforce Committee Gender Affirming Care Provider Workgroup Meeting. Uh, happy October 16th. And on to the next slide. Great. So just a brief look at the agenda. We welcomed you. We're going to go through that agenda now. We're going to go through some introductions, um, ask you a little bit about yourself, just to make sure we know everybody that's on the call, go through the background, purpose, and really scope of this work group, what we're charged to do. We have uh, taken a first blush at some um, gender affirming care resources. So we're going to go through those with you. And then we're going to review the schedule of meetings and topics that will occur through the rest of this year. And just a reminder that our next meeting will be on October 30th. Okay. Great. Super. So introductions, names and pronouns, please. Um, and the second question is, are you on are, are you on an Oregon Health Policy Board committee? And if so, which one? And then what brings you here? So I'll just quickly say again, Nick Bowen, see they pronouns. I am not on the Oregon Health Policy Board committee on any committee right now. What brings me here is um, I lovingly refer to myself as a frontier queer. I live in Eastern Oregon in Wallowa County and I have for 10 years with my partner. Um, I joined OCHIN, or excuse me, I joined OHA after leaving OCHIN after five years as their SOGI SME, uh, working with providers across the nation, training them uh, in uh, SOGI and gender affirming care. So that's why I'm, I'm on the call. So let's go ahead and go to our gallery view. And we're going to just popcorn if that's okay with you. So looking at the gallery view, I know Stephanie, you are currently muted, but would you like to come off and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I am uh, the Chief Human Resources Officer at Adapt Integrated Healthcare in Roseburg. Uh, I have been <clears throat> working in Oregon now with Adapt for almost three years, uh, and I came from higher ed in the southeastern part of the United States. Uh, I have been uh, a champion for DEI-related things all throughout my career. Um, we're trying to build more of that uh, in Roseburg. Uh, there are quite a few challenges to that just uh, on the basis of our uh, demographics there in, in Roseburg. But um, I had uh, worked with uh, the University Safe Zone Advisory Board creating uh, safe spaces for staff, faculty, and students. Um, and so in that work, I saw a lot of students that were often kicked out of their homes for coming out, uh, parents taking away their uh, the funds for them to have a place to live or to go to college and uh, just just a lot of challenges that were faced in in that community, particularly as it related to gender affirming care uh, and those that were in the transgender community. So it was something that was close to my heart to try to provide uh, help and care for those individuals and all the way through any type of medical or health care, you know, and, and as I said, up until about three years ago, I was working in higher ed and not in healthcare, so the venue is a little bit different, uh, and so it gives me an opportunity to expand uh, in that skill set a little bit and, and focus on helping our providers get that kind of skill, too. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, would you like to popcorn to somebody else, or would you like me to assign that? <laughs> uh, sure. Let's go to Dell. Thank you. Dell Knight, they, them pronouns. Um, I'm not part of a committee. And what brings me here is um, I am a therapist, a trans and gender career therapist who exclusively works within that community. Um, I've written, I don't even know how many gender affirming care letters. And I've heard all the stories about both gender affirming care providers and those who purport to be. So I really want to be in this arena to really try and at least help influence policy to really help those that I've been serving for years. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Del, and love your cat. Oh, thank you. Love, I you want you your pet, and it here. calmed me down. It really did. It just, thanks. I, this is on it. He on is. X. Hi. <laughs> love. I love his pronoun. Would you like uh, to popcorn to somebody else? Sure. Uh, Christina. Thank you. Thanks, Del. 
Hi everyone, my name is Christina Stewart, she, her pronouns. Um, I am not in the committee. I do work for OHA. I was asked to be a part of this work group. I work in um, our reproductive health program, which is um, in the public health division at OHA. Um, yeah, supporting clinicians to do um, good quality reproductive health care in our state. Um, outside of my work at OHA, I also have a clinical practice um, where I do prescribe gender affirming hormones for folks, um, and I really enjoy that um, that part of my work. And so, yeah, here I am. I will um, popcorn to Levi. Hi there. My name's Levi Anderson, and I use he him pronouns. Um, I'm like Meg, I guess I've never heard that before. I'm a frontier queer too. I like that. I might steal that. Uh, I live in Malheur County, uh, specifically in Vail, and uh, I'm part of the healthcare workforce committee. I'm brand new to it, like haven't even been on it for a year. Um, I work for Oregon Department of Human Services Self-Sufficiency, and the other hat that I wear is I'm a coalition coordinator for our uh, queer group called One Community All Spirits, and um, I just would like to learn more about how to promote this initiative to our healthcare partners, um, whether it needs to be in like a business setting, like, hey, here's how you can help your bottom line. Unfortunately, sometimes that's the language, right? Um, but then also just to get the foot in the door to, to get this rolling a little bit better here. Thanks, Levi. Thanks so much. Hi, neighbor. <laughs> Would you like to pass it off to somebody else? How about Julia? Great. Hi, folks. My name is Julia Pshadvorsky. I'll put the pronunciation in the chat because I know it's challenging especially with the last name. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. Uh, I am a member of the Health Equity Committee. Um, and what brings me here today? Well, Alex most directly, because they sent me an email being like, hey. <laughs> so thank you, Alex. Uh, I am a queer and trans health equity researcher. I consider myself a feral researcher. Uh, I do community-based research, uh, not affiliated with academic institutions. Um, and I also am a trainer on queer and trans inclusive healthcare. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julia. We're glad you're here. Um, we'd like to pass it off to someone else. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Beck. Great. Can you hear me? No, you're breaking up a little bit back. I, I'm in a very rural area in Ohio currently, and my service is terrible. <laughs> it just came through. It sounds good right you now. You did. You're okay, perfect you right now. Don't okay. move. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll stay right here. Uh, standing on one foot. Um, so I, I think it counts. Uh, I reside in the county on the coast. We've lost you again. I'm sorry, but oh, gee. that's okay. I'm gonna put it in the chat. Okay, We're okay. All good. If that's okay, that's thank perfect. you, and no stay worries. safe in Ohio. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Thanks, Beck. Well, Alex, let's popcorn it to you. Okay, sure. I'm glad thank you, you. My, I know, I my name just came up. Hi, everyone. <laughs> my name is Alex Friedman. I use they them pronouns, and I'm happy to be co-facilitating today with Meg. I work at OHA. I'm familiar with a few of the people here because I'm the staff representative for the Health Equity Committee of the Oregon Health Policy Board, and I think that kind of connects to what brought me here. I feel like the work that I get to do with the with the Health Equity Committee of the policy board is so special to me and so meaningful to me. It's really like what keeps me coming back to my job at OHA because of the community members that I get to work with and and the relationships that we've built over the last two and a half years that I've been working at OHA. And I just think that this gender affirming care work is such an amazing example of what's possible when 
we really do meaningful community engagement work. The health equity community members, I just, I'll get to say more about this when I present a little bit later, but just seeing the way the community has led this work and how OAJ now is making some real investment and in building momentum towards policy change around gender affirming care, that's what makes me feel excited and hopeful. And that's a precious resource these days. So I'll say that enough. I'll say that that's enough for now. You'll hear a lot more from me. But yeah, I'm really just proud of my community and proud to be a queer non-binary person in this space today. So, okay, maybe next I'll pass to um, Neelam. Um, hi everyone, Neelam Gupta, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm in the Clinical Supports Integration and Workforce um, Unit uh, in the Health Policy and Analytics Division of OHA. Um, and it's within um, uh, my team that the Healthcare Workforce Committee sits. So, so nice to um, uh, see some familiar faces and meet some new folks as well. So thank you, um, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Koi. Yeah, thanks, Neelam. I, hi, everyone. I'm Koi Vu. Uh, pronouns she, her, hers. Um, I am the executive director of the Coalition of Community Health Clinics and um, also part, uh, well, I'm part of the Healthcare Workforce Committee um, and also the Racial Justice Health Equity Committee, which is actually happening right now at three o'clock. So um, I told them I'll be late. Um, and so I do uh, will jump out as soon as um, our meeting is over. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to bring in some insight to that group or vice versa as well. Um, I'm here as an ally and um, hopefully um, bring in uh, one person, but um, as part of a, uh, you know, group, the immigrant and refugee community group, uh, community, and then also communities of color as well. Um, I am also hoping um, something that I brought up in the work for healthcare workforce committee. I believe in a, in a, in the chat is um, potentially bringing in um, some of our member clinics who do have um, who do work with um, with um, community members and gender affirming care, PRISM being one of them, um, and then also Cascadia as well. And so just wanted to see what um, what those possibilities are to bring um, other perspectives and of other providers into the space. And I would love to see youth perspective yes. here as well. Mm -hmm. Very much so, super. Thank you so much, Koi. Who would like to pass it off to? Okay. Deep D, we'd like to go. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. it's okay. No, <laughs> go I was ahead. I'm going to hand it off to Deep D for you. No, it's okay. I was about to close my <laughs> the door. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deep D Shinde. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a little under the weather today. My kids finally uh, broke through my immunity and got me, got me sick. Um, but I'm very happy to be here today. I'm uh, new on Neelam's team. I, I work for the primary care office as the lead, um, and I'll also be help, uh, helping to staff the healthcare workforce committee. So I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Um, and I think what brings me to this work is, um, you know, I've been with OHA for over 10 years, and I think some of the most like fulfilling work that I've done has been in committees like this, um, where it's a group of dedicated volunteers who really care about a topic um, and want to, you know, affect change. I think those have been um, wonderful opportunities. So I'm very happy to be here and, and meet you. Um, and I will pass it off to Devlin. Hi, everyone. Devlin Prince, he, him. I am at OHA and I sit in the Office of Health Policy. I'm a senior policy analyst and I work on many different projects and programs that deal with coverage. The one that I mostly handle is Healthier Oregon program, which is the coverage for people regardless of their immigration status here in the state of Oregon. And I also get to help out with the gender affirming care work group. Uh, and then personally, I have taken care of and been a part of community where people have received gender affirming care. So I'm just I'm so happy to be here. Thank you all. 
Wonderful. And I'll pass it to M. Hi, everyone. I am so stoked to be in this space with y'all today. I'm M. Drogi. I use she and they pronouns. I work at OHA. I'm a member of our government relations team. And y'all might be asking, why is government relations in this space? And honestly, it's a great question. But I am hoping to come to this space, not necessarily only from my government relations perspective, but from um, my own lived experience navigating gender affirming care in Oregon, the experience of the folks that I love in this world who have navigated gender affirming care and it saved their lives. Um, I'm just really excited that this space is happening and I'm really happy to be here and happy to bring back these recommendations to our agency and it'll be incredible to share space with y'all. And I will pass it to Danielle. Wow, what an amazing group of people. I must be amazing too, uh, to be here. So that's awesome. Um, the question is, where am I from? Uh, so my name is Danielle Mancuso. I use they or she pronouns. I actually work at La Clinica in Medford, Oregon. Um, and I am the gender affirming care coordinator here. We, uh, La Clinica received a grant for, yeah, for seating, from Seating Justice, an amazing organization. And I am working to build infrastructure um, within the organization to help offer gender affirming care as part of primary care. Wow. Um, yeah. And um, it, it, uh, my background is in higher ed. Um, uh, during COVID, I got a second master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. So I'm also um, working towards licensure um, and um, and so a lot of my work is a commitment to education. I think that's been my top priority and top investment here uh, in this work. And so educating providers and staff. Um, and uh, what am I doing here? I'm not on any other OHA committees. I'm so stoked to be here with y'all and being a part of this work. Um, I, I live it, I breathe it, I be it. Um, I'm a a strong advocate, a community architect, a storyteller, got to cut me off quick sometimes. So here I am. Um, I, did I answer all the questions? I get to call on somebody. I think, um, did did Rebecca go yet? Not yet. Okay. Rebecca. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks. Also, you're also known as my new best friend. I just want you to know that straight up. So thanks. Hi, Hi Rebecca. Everyone. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet everyone in this space. I'm Rebecca Donnell, she, her pronouns. And um, I was uh, on a temporary rotation in Deep D's position for six months. And so was staffing the healthcare workforce committee, um, was part of um, the beginnings of this work and building this work group. Um, and I'm continuing on for a period of time and I'll be a staffer behind the scenes, um, helping to support this work group. I care deeply about this work as well. And so I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Did we catch everybody? Um, I haven't gone. But Please I'm do, scenes, Jessica. So. <laughs> Your work is so important, Jessica. Please. Absolutely. Just... You're the person Why, behind the thank curtain. You. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Jessica Malstrom, I use the she her pronoun series. I support the Healthcare Workforce Committee, and I also support the Health Evidence Review Commission and the Associated Commissions for both of those things. So I do a lot of behind the scenes work. I'm a little elf and I love being a part of these meetings because I get to be in the room where it happens and I love um, seeing and hearing progress. So I'm I'm here today to help, but I'm also here to learn. Love it. Thank you so and much. has anybody else not gone? If you haven't gone yet, please raise your hand so I can call on you. Not seeing anybody. All right. Well, I think we did it. I think we did it. All righty. Super. So, um, Neelam, if you could bring the slides back up, I will transition over to my partner in crime here, Alex. I'll let All right. Take it away. Wait, they Thanks told you about me. my crimes? Uh-oh. <laughs>
All right, folks. Well, I'm excited to kind of introduce us to kind of the, the topic, some of the content that we wanted to share with you today. But before I do that, I do just want to take a second to acknowledge that we spent a bunch of time here at the beginning on introductions and really presencing who's in the room. And that is intentional because as we proceed with this work, we know we have a short timeline. I'm going to get into all the details of that in a second. But they, we have to start with the people. So I really just want to say thank you to everyone who shared in the introductions about how they're impacted by this work, including external and inter internal partners. That is really unique and a special thing to see here happening at the agency. So we'll have more info on that. Also want to thank the folks who completed the survey and really talked about the identities that they're bringing that impact the way they show up for this work. I want to keep that quality of relationality and humanization throughout the work that we do here. But I am going to go ahead and deliver some content for you all. I'm going to go through quickly some of the slides um, just so that we have more time to prioritize like questions and answers. Just hear kind of what's what sticks out to you and what you hear want to hear more about. So please slow me down. Please raise your hand or put something in the chat if you do have a question as we move forward. And I'll pause for questions a few times. Okay, so we're going to do like a quick kind of history lesson of how we got here. Some of this is just copied and pasted from the overview document that we sent out. So I'm not going to read most of it verbatim. There are a few things that I think are important to read to you because they're the language that we received from the director's office, for example. But this part here is just talking a little bit about some of the like catalyzing or initial actions that started this project down the line. So I really want to just call out the Oregon Health Policy Board's Health Equity Committee, a few of the members are here today, that wrote a letter on gender affirming care to the Oregon Health Policy Board, really naming some of the critical equity issues for queer and trans people here in Oregon, and especially around gender affirming care. There was a wide range of recommendations in that. You can see that there is a link to that letter. It is publicly available. You'll have these slides. So you can click on that link and look at it. Look at all the recommendations in there on your own time. Happy to talk about those more, but there are a few recommendations that are very pertinent to this work group. So we're gonna look at those in a second. You can go to the next slide. What happened from there is that the Oregon Health Policy Board passed that letter up to the Oregon Health Authority's director, Dr. Sajal Hathi, and Dr. Sajal Hathi pretty quickly turned around and wrote a letter with some specific requests for actions to happen. Now, I am gonna read these in particular because they are really what defines the work that we're doing here today. So this is the request from Dr. Hathi. It asks to establish a gender affirming care provider work group, that's this work group, to advise OHA and OHBB on ways to improve training, hiring and retention of gender affirming care providers in partnership with Oregon Health Policy Board's Health Equity Committee and with OHA's internal gender affirming care work group. So all the reason why there's these folks represented here today. Now the second part is to launch conversations on this topic and report back to OHA director with preliminary recommendations by the end of 2024. And that's what we're doing right now. This is the first one we're launching the conversation. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Now, I, I also really wanted to highlight the actions that are outlined in that letter. So we have the first one here, which I think is kind of covered in the previous slide, that the Healthcare Workforce Committee, that's Neelam Neelam's team, and some of the folks that are represented here, are kind of convening, so they're like the core, the host of the Gender Affirming Care Provider work group, starting in September 2024 to the, develop those preliminary recommendations. But there's also a second action in that letter. We kind of put it in italics because we wanted to highlight that even though these are both important actions and there is action happening on both of them, that the second one is not actually in the scope of this work group. So there might be times where we're talking about or really thinking about reflecting on the need for a healthcare workforce needs assessment. We're talking about like needs assessment and gaps and coverage, I'm sure that will come up in many different ways, but that that analysis is not actually part of the mandate for this work group. So we just wanted to make sure that like, if you look at the letter, that those actions are there side by side, but that that's not actually what we're gonna work on here in this work group. So let me just pause for a minute. I feel like that's a kind of first round of information of how we got here. Does anyone immediately have questions? Like, wait, just one more clarification on that or something that I might've missed that you wanted to add. No rush. And is there somebody also on our kind of facilitation team, Meg or someone else who has an eye on the chat? I just don't have it up on right now. Perfect. All right, well, I let's totally keep going. Mm -hmm. 
let's keep going. And if any point questions come up, just great. We'll slow down. So we put this slide on here to just, again, acknowledge who's here in the space and all the expertise that people are bringing. We didn't want to put people's names on the slide without their consent. So we, instead of doing that, we just listed some of the organizations that are represented. But, you know, I don't, I don't even think that just listing the organizations really captures all of the hugely important lived experience, professional experience and expertise that people are bringing here to this work group. And this is just the beginning. The folks that are here in the room today, they're not the full scope of who is included in this work group. So I don't know, I'm just excited. I just wanted a little moment of, of like enthusiasm and acknowledgement and thank you. Thank you all so much for showing up. I also want to acknowledge here on the other side, you can see that the OHA staff um, representation, we listed people's departments and divisions. And this is a pretty wide scope to be here, especially in this small of a work group. And I think that again, speaks to how much gender affirming care in general touches so many different parts of the work that the Oregon Health Authority does. And also how much people care about being here. Uh, I'll just say that gender affirming care at this point in the agency's kind of work and directives is not a specific part of pretty much anyone's position description, but people are coming here because they're personally impacted or they're personally passionate about doing this work. So really, really grateful again to see that enthusiasm and commitment for people to come and show up here. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so a couple things I want to say about OHA actions to date, kind of again, doing a little bit more context setting, but this time like internally to OHA. I don't feel the need to like read through all of this. I'm sure most of you are really familiar with House Bill 2002, which passed in the 2023 long session. And we do have a link here at the top if you want to see the kind of initial website around OHP's, the Oregon Health Plan's gender affirming care coverage, expansions to that coverage. I say initial because the internal gender affirming care work group at OHA is currently working with some communications experts and staff to really augment and improve what we're presenting to community and to the public around our gender affirming care work. But you can see here in the bullet points, there's some details around the types of expansions, really incredible life-saving care that House Bill 2002 implemented. And also, I just want to acknowledge that House Bill 2002 covered a lot of other really important life-saving care around reproductive health, school-based health centers, a lot of amazing work. So just we're focusing here on gender-affirming care, but that's not the entire breadth of House Bill 2002. One thing I do want to mention in this first set of bullet points at the end, there is that acknowledgement of the requirement for DCBS, the Department of Consumer and Business Services, and the Oregon Health Authority to monitor network adequacy for gender affirming care providers. Again, that's kind of like we had those two actions and the second one was really around like that needs assessment and, and gap analysis. That's not specifically the mandate of this work group. It's outside of our scope. Still just want to acknowledge how important that work is. Okay, so then just want to mention the internal Oregon Health Authority work group was first convened to really work on the implementation of House Bill 2002 and all the implications of it. But after that kind of initial implementation phase, we really moved into just having a broader understanding of how much work gender affirming care, health equity, policy change, practice change is really gonna require. So this is an ongoing work group and I would say this is absolutely one of the top priorities of that work group, in addition to some of the communications work and other widespread policy change that really supporting this gender affirming care provider work group is top priority, especially because it has that backing of the director's office to make this really important change. Okay, so I think that's enough about like OHA background, but is there anything else that other folks would add? Okay, great, next slide. So this is not by any means like a formal or like a very <laughs> detailed map of the organization of this, this work group structure, but we did wanna at least give folks like some kind of visual aid because I feel like there's a bunch of different committees and folks might be on one, but they might not be aware of the other ones. 
if this is helpful for you, great. And I just want to kind of take us through it for a second. That the circle in the top left is not a committee, but it's just acknowledging how important the collaboration across committees is to the functioning of this work group. And you can see on the top level is like the Oregon Health Policy Board and then the OHA director, which are kind of split, but you can see that the Oregon Health Policy Board then connects to both the Health Equity Committee and Healthcare Workforce Committee, both of those being subcommittees of the Oregon Health Policy Board. And then the Oregon Health Authority director, that's Dr. Sejal Hoffi, wrote that letter that went directly to the Healthcare Workforce Committee. I think really that line represents like this mandate of like, we want you to host this collaborative gender affirming care provider recommendation committee. And then you can see all the dotted lines down at the bottom are just like all the different inputs that are moving in. There's like kind of a triangulation happening for the gender affirming care provider work group because it includes representation from both of the OHBP subcommittees, the Health Equity Committee, Healthcare Workforce Committee, and also the internal OHA, Gender Affirming Care Committee. That's all the folks that are here today. Next slide. Okay, one more slide about work group scope and I'm gonna stop here, take any more questions and then I'll pass it back to Meg. You can see these first two are just a repeat of those like requests that were in that letter from Dr. Hathi. So I'm not gonna rewrite those, but I'm gonna read what's in the blue box because I feel like that is really, that is the one sentence summary of what we're here to do. By the end of 2024, the gender affirming care provider work group, that's us, We'll make short-term recommendations that don't require legislative actions and propose next steps for 2025 through 2027 to develop legislative action items for future legislative sessions. I'm just gonna let that like sink in for a second. That is that one sentence summary of what we hope to accomplish between this meeting and over the course of the next four meetings by the end of the year. You can see there's like these two parts of it, short-term recommendations that don't require legislative actions, and then proposal of next steps for that 2025 through 2027 period to develop legislative action items. A quick question in regards Please. to the leg legislative um, direction there. So how do we know what determines what requires a legislative um, action or recommendation and what doesn't? Such a good question. And I'm glad you asked it. I'm hoping that- it's the next slide. <laughs> no, not yet, but there is gonna be, I, I think the reason I'm excited is because it really illustrates to me how important it is to have that collaboration between external folks and internal to OHA folks that really, like I don't have the answer for every recommendation or idea that we have, but our hope is that because we have representation from so many different parts of the Oregon Health Authority, that we'd really be able to identify which of the proposed changes that come up from community members, community partners, external partners, that's you all here today, that we'd be able to provide that feedback of like, okay, well, where does that fit? Does that need legislative change? Is that a rule change? Is that something that we can do on a program level? So. I, no one of us holds all that knowledge, but I'm hoping that between all of us, we'll be able to meet the needs of determining where do those different types of changes fall. Yes. Great question. Any other ones? Okay, I'm sure there'll be a million more questions. We have a few more slides to go through, so I'm gonna pass it back to you, Meg. You can take us through some of the resources that you all have identified so far. And okay. if any other questions pop up anytime, put them in the chat, we'll come back to them. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alex. Thanks for that. Hey, everybody, so what we did uh, is we took a first blush, really, at uh, finding some gender-affirming care resources. Thank you so much to Rebecca Donnell for doing this, this first dig for us. We really appreciate it. So this next slide that you'll see, these are um, gender-affirming care resources, guidelines, and toolkits. Now, we know this is not an all-inclusive list, and we know many of you on the call may have resources that th they are your go-to resources. So if you would like to drop them in the chat, that would be fantastic. If you've got a whole bunch and you want to email them after the call or later, that'd be perfect. We'd love to get 
uh, lists of your resources as well. Again, these are just um, gender affirming care resources, guidelines and toolkits. They've got Johns Hopkins and of course Planned Parenthood. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about UCSF and their transgender care program. Um, and of course the Veterans Administration. Um, so there's some fantastic information there. These are all hyperlinks. Oh, Yulia, I'm getting to that, my friend. <laughs> oh my gosh, so exciting. Okay, on to the next slide. Perfect. These are patient resources, right? We'd be remiss if we didn't bring the patient along with us on this journey, of course. So you see at first, it's the OHP, um, the gender affirming care coverage that we have. Um, outside In, many of us here in Oregon are very familiar with Outside In. Um, Prism Health. Prism Health is a, a personal favorite of mine. Um, great folks there. These are, again, patient resources. Planned Parenthood has amazing resources. OHSU Transgender Health Program, we'd be remiss, of course. And again, the VA. Um, so great resources there. We kind of go through these kind of fast. You want to make sure we get to your questions. But there's these are all these hyperlinks that you have that you can go ahead and just explore at your leisure. Yulia, check it out right there. The National LBTQIA Plus Health Education Center Learning Modules. Um, this was my personal favorite go-to um, that I've used for years. So please, if you um, you know uh, want, go ahead and click on that link when you've got some time. Enroll. Everything is free, and there are CMEs and CEUs out out the wazoo. So great resources there. Of course, University of Washington Medicine. They have their transgender and gender non-binary health program and a training program associated with that. And of course, OHSU has the transgender health program as well, and educational resources there. Okay, on to the next, we've got some gender affirming care resources for advocacy and social justice. Transponder, our friends down in Eugene, Oregon, they're a trans care advocacy program, an organization. Um, so at Oregon University has a great social justice program um, and uh, Professor Travis Campbell, Dr. Campbell, um, had a great paper out there, a study on gender affirming care um, and re reduced suicide risk. Um, and then Dr. Soja as well, um, more, uh, resources there for you. And of course, the trans lifeline. So um, on to this next one, Alex, I'm going to pass this back to you for this slide, but please feel free to drop your resources in the chat if you'd like, or if you'd like to be a little more leisurely and uh, email them to us, we'd love to see them too. So thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Alex. Yeah, thanks, Meg. And, you know, as we're kind of building this library of different resources that we're leaning on as we start to do this work. Again, just wanna just wanna say that we know this is a really fast timeline to be developing any kind of recommendations. And so we want you to know that these are some of the resources that we're gonna be using that already detail many of the types of recommendations and through community engagement um, and research and community-driven research that people throughout Oregon and nationally have done to, that, that we could use to really kind of give us a boost, give us some like a moving start as we move towards developing those recommendations. So, you know, I, I don't need to go through all of these, but I've linked almost all of them here. So again, when you have the slides, you can feel free to look through them if there's any that like really interests you. I'm really excited about the top resource here, which is um, completed by an organization, Rural Oregon Gender Hive who did a Central Oregon Trans Health Equity Report, and they have a bunch of great recommendations in there. So we're gonna be going over these between now and the next meeting that, that we have scheduled to really start to identify like what are some of those potential recommendations. And that way we're not starting from scratch as we start to build our recommendations around provider recruitment, training, and retention. So yeah, if there's any other ones here that kind of catch your attention, I'd be happy to speak more about them, but I'm just, I think maybe let's just leave them up for a second. Yuli, I'm just responding to you about the, the U.S. Transgender Survey. Thank you so much. I am remiss for not uh, adding that. Um, so yes, um, I'll make sure that we get that added. Great, great, great resource. And they just launched uh, their latest um, analysis from the last survey. And it's, they had like 96,000 respondents compared to wow. 25,000 the previous time they asked. So huge. That's incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. Thanks, Julia. All right, I think we're ready for the next slide then. Perfect. And I think this is where we were hoping to have um, Deep Tea and also 
Rebecca, if you want to support as well, just to take a little look at our map for meetings and topics from now through the end of 2024. So does that work for you, DT? Yeah, that, that sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so like Alex said, this is a, um, we wanted to give you a visual of what the rest of the year look like because um, as you've heard, you know, it's a really quick turnaround time um, to develop these recommendations. So we wanted to, um, you know, get something for you to, to react to. Um, so from now until the end of the year, we're hoping to have um, about six meetings. And so this is this is the first one. Um, and we have a, like a rough outline of what we want to cover, um, but we really want this to be work group led. And so if there are um, topics that you would like to discuss and subject matter experts that we can bring to these meetings, um, we very much want that to be, we want it to be a very interactive, interactive process. Um, and so this is like a rough outline and taking us to January, where we will be presenting our recommendations at the Oregon Health Policy Board meeting, uh, their January 2025 meeting. Um, and then after that, um, the, the work group composition will probably change a little bit and the work of the committee will, will change as well. Um, but from now until the end of the year, we're really focused on making those short term um, recommendations um, that can be presented in, in January. And Neelam and Rebecca, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add. No, nice job, DP. I think I think that covers it. Yep. The only thing I would add is that, you know, we recognize that, you know, uh, you've probably heard from us a few times, this is, you know, a very short um, timeline. And, you know, we recognize that this work is going to need to continue um, uh, in 2025 and beyond. And I think this brings us to our questions and next steps. Like, I think this is, that's the end of our content delivery at this point. We know that there's a lot to take in and we, we have like a couple of very initial questions here, but really our hope is to hear what your questions are. We're going to write them down. We're going to note them down. We're going to take them back. We're going to digest them. I know you're probably digesting a lot too. So our goal in this moment is not to have all the answers, but really to collect as many questions as we can to be able to guide what our next meetings will look like. So I think there's a lot of different questions here. I just want to mention like what's on here for next steps, that we're going to be setting up a web page and a collaborative workspace to really centralize the materials that we have for you all. So obviously we have this slide deck, for example, but also some of the reports and recommendations, and list of resources things that you also could be able to add to without having to go through us. So that's something that we're, we're working on. It can be a little tricky creating those kind of collaborative spaces with external partners too. We'll keep you updated on that for sure. Now, also the second bullet point on here is just that we have these rich responses from you all um, to the survey that we put out. And we're gonna be looking through the survey responses um, incorporating those into and guiding, having them guide our future meetings too. Okay, so open space now. I don't. We could we could just take the slides down. I feel like is there anything else on there? What do you think, Meg? I think that's great. I'm actually I've got notes up to take notes. So for Perfect. Questions yeah. Folks have. You oh yeah, I've got you. In, in real time. Mm -hmm. So we have about 10 minutes left and we would just love to hear kind of people's just like initial thoughts and reactions. It does not have to be fully formed. It doesn't have to be well articulated. What are some of those kind of initial feelings when you hear about this is what the work group is for. This is what we're hoping to do by the end of the year. This is what we're hoping to do after the end of the year. And if you can't find the words, please feel free to use your react emojis. <laughs> I, I'm so excited about this. I can't, I'm just, and thank you for the layout and the, and yes, I am definitely an information overload. 
and just elated and thrilled to be here. So I can definitely say that clearly. And thank you, yeah, for again for a deep deep for the layout of of the what we're doing at each meeting and and that's really helpful for me. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for voicing that the information overload and also the excitement. They can be side by side. Hi, this is Yulia. I think, um, you know, I appreciate the work getting started. I think an important piece here will be kind of acknowledging that a big part of what we're going to probably end up doing is identifying specifically the work that needs to happen for us to actually come up with comprehensive recommendations and who else needs to be at the table to make sure. So kind of I think it would be amazing if we could come up with specific actionable recommendations that can be implemented in the short term while also being like within this timeline, being very specific about, okay, well, what would this actually take to come up with a comprehensive, legislatively appropriate set of recommendations? So I'm excited to do the work. And I also want to be humble about what we can effectively accomplish with the folks like in the timeline and given that there hasn't been a comprehensive, yeah. there have, hasn't been time to comprehensively reach out to folks from across yeah. the different kinds of communities that need right. to be involved in order to help build these kinds of recommendations. Yeah. Yeah, really well said, Nelia, and, and thank you. I feel like it's worth just really being with that for a minute, just the like, acknowledgement of like, we the group that we've assembled here today is amazing it's not all the people who even are on the workforce committee and the health equity committee and the hpg 2235 committee that have committed there's more people and that's still not enough like we're still not representative of the entire communities that we want to make sure are represented when we're doing this type of engagement and i i just want to represent some of the conversations we've had in planning of just acknowledging that no, this is not enough time to develop comprehensive recommendations and it's not enough representation either. And that after this, in that 2025 through 2027 window, we need a larger group. We need a more comprehensive engagement process. And I, I think of that as one of the most kind of immediate recommendations is really determining what is that engagement going to look like? What do we need to request? It's going to require more resources too. But anyways, we don't have to get into the details, but yeah. But this is a great start. And I think if mm -hmm. we as a group could come up with like, think strategically about how do we set up this effort long-term for success? Like that feels like a really important way that we can contribute in this short term. Be like, hey, how do we make sure that this happens appropriately? Like you're saying, Alex, like, oh, we need to make sure that this is appropriately resourced, yeah. you know, things like that. So I really appreciate that sort of thought that y'all are already putting into it. And I'm, I'm super glad that we're all aligning on it. <laughs> Great so far. Any other initial reactions? Please. Go Always for it, Yulia. Reactions. Yeah. So please feel free to be like, okay, you need to stop talking now. No, no. Um, super happy to have that feedback. But <laughs> <laughs> one thing that I was wondering is, so I'm super glad that there'll be this sort of work group in a way it's for us to, given the short timeline and, you know, meeting for an hour may, we might not be able to turn around as much during this kind of setting. So also are there ways that we could maybe collectively or asynchronously think through like how do we work best and contribute best to efforts like this because not for not everybody thrives in meetings like this yeah. um and creating as many opportunities for folks to be able to make these kinds of contrib important contributions over you know so a we're efficient and and super accessible 
Um, and I know that's sort of something that, uh, you know, Alex, you're thinking about all the time and other folks at OHA are thinking about all the time, but it could also be great to invite folks who are like, you know what, I work really great on shared documents. If you give me like a few days to process that and add comments versus I want to be able to like have a brainstorming work group, yeah. you know, or breakout room to talk about a specific aspect. So just getting a sense of like, since a number of mm. us are kind of working together for the first time, how do we work well together right. to really take as much advantage of like the collective wisdom that we can all bring to to try to accomplish you know what we we're hoping to accomplish completely agree Leah. thank you so much for that i think that's really important for us to think at especially think about early in the process because i think really maximizing that engagement is going to require us to really like first of all be creative in the ways that we engage people and also to really ask people how and identify how do you want to be engaged so yeah i think i'm going to think about that a little bit of what's the best way to kind of reach out to all the people who are represented here how what are what are the opportunities that we can give you for engagement and also which of those really work for you can all just be meetings right Okay, so we have about four minutes left, and I just want to make sure that we're not missing anyone who has a burning comment or question right now. I do think it might be a good time to start wrapping up. So I do, I just want to nin, I have this feeling of like there was something that I was going to ask the group. And like, was it in the gender referring care, like our steering committee, like I know Devlin is here and M had to leave. Devlin, wasn't there something that I was going to ask today? Um, nothing's coming to mind. I know I'm going to remember it immediately after I get off this call, and I'm going to be so frustrated. <laughs> or later on tonight, let me do 2 a.m. Oh, no, please. Don't don't yeah. curse me with that. Alex, yes, this is Maria. Maria. Did, Hi, Maria. Did you, hello, sorry I was super late, but do you remember about the low-hanging fruit? Do you want to talk about low-hanging fruit for a second? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. So we were thinking at one point that there might that there must be things that we haven't thought because you know we are policy people. We overcomplicate things to the extreme. But is there any low hanging fruit? Is there anything, any wins that we could do with the tweak? Sometimes OHA has so much power. Are there are there things that perhaps you say, oh, that's a no brainer? But it turns out we don't do it. Are there any? In any in any setting and in anything related to this that you may think that that's a that would be a quick thing to do, a good win, you have the power to do it. Why don't you do it? I mean, it could be part of the recommendations, it could be something that we work on on the on, on a separate level, but we were thinking about is there a possibility to find things that would be easier for us to move forward. That will that that will create some wins that I think we are gonna need because this is gonna be on like in a long haul type of thing. So I think that was and that was probably me, Alex. Me, you and I had a conversation around uh -huh. low hanging. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marie. I think that's so true. And especially just like we've gotten this window where the director's office is like, I we wanna hear this now. You know, and I think that there are many things that maybe we've been thinking about for a long time, but this is that moment to say, hey, here's this thing that we know that we need to change. It could be a small change that could have an impact on a small or a huge number of people. So thank you for articulating that, Maria. I think that was a really important thing to keep in mind. I'm definitely thinking about we're going to be meeting again tomorrow, our kind of planning group to talk about this. Just like how do we organize those different types of recommendations? I know we have first named them as like short term, long term. There might be other dimensions to those type of recommendations too, maybe specific to types of topics or to the types of change that they're going to require. So really important things to think about. Thanks Ooh, for that, Del. I love that, Del. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And just to kind of add to that, like the WPATH 8 standards, which, you know, there can be some complications about WPATH as well, but they've actually talked about the fact that it's red tape. And, you know, I think that that 
it almost feels crafty about low hanging fruit, but boy, would that remove a lot of barriers for a yeah. lot of people. Yeah. Just, I just set up all these systems in uh, Epic to make letter writing easier. And I would love to be like, that was wasted time. I would love to see that. <laughs> just like throw that, that away. <laughs> I would love that for you, Danielle. <laughs> All right, folks. Yeah, it's four o'clock. I think let's go ahead and close the meeting for today.